Today we talk about something that scientists have tried to prove never happened. Jonah and the whale. Now, here's what scientists have said. There is no fish alive that could swallow a human. Okay? Now, here's the craziest thing. We don't know anything like that for one reason. If you listen to the scientists, you would think that the whales today are the largest fish that have ever lived. Yet we know there was such a thing as dinosaurs. Therefore, if there's such a thing as dinosaurs, then couldn't there also be fish that are bigger? So what happened is, in South Africa a couple of years ago, a tour dive guy, he was out diving, and a great whale came along and swallowed him. And he was in the mouth of a whale for over 30 seconds before the whale spit him out. And therefore, what happens is this whole thing of scientists saying, this story is fictional, there's no whale that can swallow a human, shows that, you know what? You scientists really need to learn the Bible. So today we study this incredible story, oh my goodness, about Jonah and the whale. Now, let's talk, okay? God says, Jonah, go to Nineveh. And Jonah, he runs away from God's will. The reason is, okay, Nineveh was anti-Semitic. It was the capital of Assyria, which was a very large capital. But listen to this, the average town was around 200 to 500 people. This city was 120,000. Now, when you compare that to the city of Toronto, but you have to understand there's no cars. Okay, traffic is donkeys. Okay, so 120,000 people would be equal today to a city of around 12 million. Now, here's the craziest thing. The Assyrians hated Jewish people. Remember, I've talked to you last week Throughout history, history has always hated Jewish people. And Jonah is a Jewish prophet. And God says to Jonah, go to Nineveh, Jonah, and you will redeem and help them get redeemed and saved. And Jonah says, are you nuts? They killed Jews. They hate Jews. I want all of Nineveh to go to hell. If I go to Nineveh as a Jew and rescue Nineveh, I'm turning my back on my people who have been killed by the Nineveh people. No way, God. So now you gotta understand, Jonah probably wasn't that bright for one reason. He gets in a boat to try to run away from God's will. What do you learn from this? You can't run from God's will. He not only knows where you are, but he also knows what you think. Isn't that spooky? Are you ready? So what happens is he's on a boat and all of a sudden God creates a storm and the boat starts rocking and rolling. And this is one of the first mentions of rock and roll in the Bible, okay? Okay, here's the scripture we start off with. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Jonah chapter one, verse 13. Instead, the men did their best to row back to the land because the boat was rock and rolling, and they could not, for the seas grew even wilder than before because God was ticked off. Then they cried out to the Lord, please, Lord, do not let us die for taking this man's life because Jonah came along and said, boys, if you throw me overboard, everything will be good. And they said, we can't kill you. And they said, no. Jonah goes, look, I'm the guy who's caused this mess. Okay, throw me overboard. Okay, so listen to this. Then they took Jonah and threw him overboard and the raging seas grew calm. And this, the men greatly feared the Lord and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows to him. Now the Lord provided, okay, look at this, are you ready? 
the Lord provided a huge fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the whale for three days. We have the boat. This is the water. We need a whale. People, call for the whale. Under the sea, under the sea, under the sea, under the sea. Ladies and gentlemen, church on the Queensway whale. it's better, down where it's wetter, take it from me. And all of a sudden, Jonah is swimming in the water, ready to drown because he's not very good. And all of a sudden, the whale comes along. And the whale says, P.U., you stink, man. I'm not eating you. (laughs) Okay, wrong whale. Okay, (laughs) ladies and gentlemen, would you give the whale a big hand? Darling, it's better down where it's better. He gets paid. We have to do something with him. Okay. (laughs) Are you ready? Number one, Jonah hears God. Jonah hears God. Jonah, go to Nineveh. No pick and wham going to Nineveh. There's not a place. Are you nuts? They hate Jews. Hello, I'm Jewish. Number two, they kill Jews. Hello, I'm Jewish. Number three, I don't want them to have your mercy and your grace. God, I'm not going to Nineveh. Jonah hears God. Now, there's some of you here going, well, I don't hear God. Are you nuts? Open the Bible. As soon as you read the Bible, all scriptures are inspired by God. That's God speaking to you. I mean, here's the voice. If you're waiting for the voice of God, Keep waiting. I mean, here's the craziest thing. Some people say to me, oh, I don't hear God. The reason you don't hear God is you don't read God's word. When was the last time you took God's word seriously? Jesus said in the parable of soul, we need to hear it, retain it, persevere, and produce it. here's, Here's the thing. Jonah hears God's word. What does he do? He runs from it. Number two, he hurts God. Now, let's just make this applicable because I don't know anybody here who's, you know, God's saying, go win all of Toronto to Jesus. We all will do that together. But when was the last time you hurt God by hearing God from his word, even in the small things? and you slap them in the face by not doing it. Let me give you an illustration of this, and for some of you, you'll say you're too trivial, and I'm not. I believe the church is run on the widow's might. The theology of this is the widow who had next to nothing brought her tithe to the church, and she gave it to the church, the temple, and they used it to help the church grow. Let me just share this with you. A lot of people think this church survives on big donations. We don't have big donations. What it survives on, every one of us tithing every week when we all pull together. And for that reason, we teach the staff, we teach the pastors this incredible lesson. When you leave a room, turn the light off. If we're not using a room during the week, the air conditioning goes down off. Okay, we try to save money. We, we, what we're doing do is save incredible money because if you save a little bit of money, then you're going to save a lot of money. I believe it's biblical. I believe it's God's will. This morning at 5.45 in the morning, I'm here at the church. I'm in the gymnasium praying for the children. Now, for those who are live streaming, you don't understand the gymnasium, there's a hallway that goes to the gymnasium and the hallway's around 18 kilometers long. And I get out of the gym and I start walking halfway down the hallway and I hear a little voice. Now, whether it's God or not, it doesn't matter. Practice what you preach. 
stop being a hypocrite. And I stop and I think, what am, what am I doing wrong? Go back to the gym, you didn't turn the light off. It was only one night. And I said, halfway down the hallway, whether it was God or not, I said, Lord, I'm 18 kilometers from the gym. I'm an old man. He says, practice what you preach. I go back all the way to the gym. Of course, I needed a breakfast by the time I got there. I turn off the one light, and all of a sudden, I feel peace. Jesus says, if you're faithful in the small things, did you hear this? He'll bless you in the big things. See, a lot of us, we hear God, but then we hurt God. When you are disobeying his will, when you're, when you're going against his will, you're hurting God. How many of you, you, you've had a thought in your head, you should say God bless you to that person, or, or you should stop and help that person, or maybe you should just say, can I pray for you? You ever have those little thoughts in your head, and you, 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 you wash them away real fast because you don't want to do them? Have you ever thought that's God? You're hurting God? I need to text so-and-so just an encouragement. No, no, I don't have time. You're hurting God. And what happens is all of us in this room, we have experiences in our lives that we are like Jonah. Now, it's not Nineveh, but we have experiences. Example, when was the last time you heard somebody who was anti-Semitic, they were not pro-Jewish and not pro-Israel, and you stood up for God's people? Or when was the last time you, 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 know, you, you, you had somebody come along and you knew it wasn't God's will, and you stood in there and did God's will? See, all of us have heard God and we're hearing God as we read his word. And we even hear God sometimes with our thoughts or from people or from sermons or from worship. But so many of us keep hurting God. And when you hurt God, then the storms of life will come along and not only hurt you, but hurt those around you. Notice Jonah wasn't the only one who was being hurt by God but it was those around him. Do you know that you influence the blessing of God on people around you? I feel sorry for some kids because their parents are, are doing so many things to hurt God and it's hurting the kids. The third one is this. Jonah hears God, then he hurts God, but then he helps God. And the reason he helps God is he's in the whale going, please forgive me, get me out of here. Okay, I will go to Nineveh. I mean, what is God's will? Are you ready? God's will is to help God. That's it. So somebody says to me, give me application for this sermon. Are you ready? Understanding life. A couple of weeks ago, this guy's on the phone with me and he says, I don't understand life. And I said, what? He says, no, seriously, I don't understand life. You know, and he's yelling at me. I said, life is easy. I said, here it is, do God's will. I don't know God's will, right? I said, read the Bible. No, I a lot of times don't know specifics Example, you know, there's many specifics in my life right now I'm asking God for, but what I'm doing is every day just living according to his word or trying my best. See, understanding life, here it is. Are you ready? Do God's will. My dad taught me this. When I graduated from high school, I graduated from high school. I said, Dad, I don't know what I want to be in life. I think I want to go into television and so forth. He says, just do God's will. I said, well, what's God's will? 
He says, God will lead you as long as you keep praying and studying God's word and start to, do, right? And all of a sudden, God took me through all these steps, and when I look back, I can see God's will in my life, but going through it, I didn't really know God's will except to remain faithful in prayer and in Bible and just keep trying to hear the voice of God or see the w- voice of God or see the will of God around me. And as you do God's will, you hear God, but you also bless God instead of hurting God, and you help God. See, God's will is when I help others. And that's what Jonah was made for. He was made to bless Nineveh. Have you ever heard the saying from the Bible, love your enemies? Corey Tamboon is in a Holocaust camp during the World War II. The Nazis have put her and her sister Betsy in the Holocaust camp with the Jewish people. Corey Tamboon's not Jewish. Her sister's not Jewish, but they were hiding Jewish people in their house. Betsy says to Corey in the Holocaust when they're having nothing to eat and they're freezing and people are dying around them. Betsy says, we need to pray for the soldiers that they will come to know our Savior, Jesus Christ. And Corey says, I hate them. I want them to go to hell. And Betsy says, please, Corey, don't say that. They need Jesus. See, Jonah wanted Nineveh to go to hell. Here's the truth, and and if we gave you truth serum so you told the truth, is there anybody in your life you would like to go to hell? And here's the truth from me. There was, and it took me two weeks of prayer to switch from hell to heaven with that person. Now, has that person improved their behavior towards me? No, matter of fact, it's got worse since I've been praying that they go to heaven. Right? But that's an attack from hell wanting me to go back so I'm not biblical and doing God's will. It is not biblical to pray somebody into hell. It is biblical only to pray them into heaven. Understanding God's will, well... We always will work on that. Number two, understanding life, how? By trusting God. Here's the truth, I don't know what I'll be doing in a year from now, but I do know that I'm trusting God. I know that I'll be working tomorrow, Tuesday, Wednesday this week, but I'm trusting God that he will keep me healthy so I can do this. You just have to trust him. Jonah, trust the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your understanding about Nineveh. But your own understanding is they hate Jews and you hate them. Let that go. In all your ways, acknowledge God and he'll direct your path. But I don't like what he's doing, so what? I remember four years of age when my parents would make me brush my teeth. It was the worst experience going. I did not like brushing my teeth. And boy, did I complain. And my dad, a couple times, he had enough of me and he just opened my mouth and he brushed my teeth. Well, friends, just so you know, when I was eight years old, I had to get a filling in one of my teeth. After that drilling, I learned Brushing your teeth is good. When I heard and then I felt it because she didn't put enough freezing in my mouth, all of a sudden I realized mommy and daddy were right. See, there's a lot of times when God says do his will and we go, no, I don't like it. But he's right. Trusting him. Number three, we need to understand, we need to trust, but then we need to learn from God. What you sow, you reap. So Jonah, if you wanna run from God, then be as dumb as you can, and I say that in respect to him now, 
But here's the truth, you can't hide from God and you can't beat God in a fight. You might as well give in, it's easier. Jonah, what were you thinking? By getting on the boat and going some other where you were gonna win? So Jonah was taught by God. And we need to let God teach us. We not only need God to teach us his will, but we need God to teach us how to trust him. Then we need God to help us trust him. We need to learn how to hear him from scripture and hear him in our hearts and in our minds. I, I see, I, I joke about this, but I mean it very sincerely. I wish God's voice in me had a Jewish accent so I knew it was him. You understand? The point is, I, th there's many times when, it, was that God or was that me? As long as it's biblical, who cares? Who cares? Let it be biblical. So somebody says to me, why is this so important to you today? Well, today's an incredibly special day. Is there anybody from Uganda? Just yell out if you're from Uganda. Great. Here's the craziest thing. There's this couple years ago, Gary and Marilyn Skinner, 45 years ago. They're in a little town called Listerwell, Ontario. Anybody from Listerwell? Anybody been to Listerwell? You have? God bless you. One person, more Ugandans than Listowell. Here we go. The population back then was under 2,000 people. Beautiful little community to raise your family in. They had a church, they had a house, they had a white picket fence, there's no crime, the school was close to their house. It was a perfect place to raise your family. You understand? Dear Lord, we want your will. Please give us your will. And all of a sudden God says to them, you're moving from Listowell, Ontario, no crime, to Kampala, Uganda. There's a dictator who hates white people. His name is Idi Amin. He and his soldiers hate white people. And what they do is they torture you before they kill you. They rape the wives, and then they torture the husbands. And the Skinners, Gary and Marilyn Skinner, say to the Lord, we're going to go to Kampala. And all of a sudden, the denomination they work for said, you can't go there, you'll die. And they said, God is sending us to Kampala, Uganda. You can't go there, you're white. You have three kids. Every one of you will die. And Gary and Marilyn said, we will die in Kampala, Uganda. They go to Kampala, Uganda over 41 years ago, and they start a church, and today's their 40th anniversary of a church called Watoto. Are you ready? For those who don't know Watoto, Idi Amin was on his way out as they were coming in, and the Skinners never knew this, <laughs> okay? And all of a sudden, they needed a church because there's too many Christians now. They've led to Christ. And so they wanted a church in central Kampala, and my story in the first service was not corrected. My wife, in, the, in between, she made sure I was right with God. There's a theater that was condemned in downtown Kampala, but beside it was the dormitories for the army for the Idi Amin. And the soldiers had left it, but they wrecked it before they left it. And there was a large auditorium in there. 
And nobody wanted to go in there because the soldiers used to. So Gary and Marilyn said, could we have that building? And, and Campella said, sure, nobody else wants it. Right? Because they're scared the army would come back and kill them. And Gary went in and he cleaned it up with Marilyn and all of a sudden Christians started to come and Canadians and Americans started donating money and all of a sudden they had this dormitory then they built bought the theater which was condemned and the roof was blown off and they got that and then they all of a sudden they started an orphanage where tens of thousands of kids have gone through. Matter of fact, the vice president of Uganda is from Watoto Orphanage, okay, pilots, medical doctors, okay? Matter of fact, one of the greatest doctors in all of Uganda teaches at the medical school, he's with Toto, right? These kids all over, they have this thing, oh, we're with Toto, right? Well, somebody says to me, why is it a great day today? Are you ready? Listerwell, Ontario, Gary and Marilyn, you can't go, you'll get killed. Let me tell you how bad it was when they got there. Are you ready? The thieves would come to their house with guns and rob them. And when the thieves left, two hours later, other thieves would come and want to rob them. And Gary and Marilyn said, you're two hours late. The thieves got it two hours ago, so the thieves would chase the thieves to get the stuff. That's how bad it was. Marilyn and Gary said, we had nothing except the shirts on our back. Our kids grew up to know there could be a gun in their face. We grew up to know that, Marilyn said, I grew up to know that I could get raped any day. That's how bad it was. And then she, with a smile, she's only five feet tall. Matter of fact, she's four foot ten, but she won't say it. She says, it was the best time of our life because we were in the center of God's will. Let, let me tell you about Watoto, are you ready? They have a burden because there's a ghetto in Kampala. Now, if you're a tourist, they don't want you to see this. It's where people live in cardboard shacks. And, and it, literally, Eight feet by eight feet, there will be a lady there with four kids. Eight feet by eight feet in a cardboard shack. And she will have a little stove like this that she shares with other people, and they will cook their rice. And Gary and Marilyn Skinner, they see this, and they go down and they start leading prostitutes with children to Christ. And what they do is they start to teach these prostitutes about Jesus and get them saved and filled with the Holy Spirit. And all of a sudden, start to train them how to read and how to write these prostitutes. And all of a sudden, then they start training them on how to run businesses. And, and when you go down to the ghetto now, you will meet a lot of these ladies who are part of the church, who are discipleship group leaders and pr intercessory prayer warriors, and they still work in the ghettos, and they're still there with all the other people, leading other people to Christ. Are you ready? They used to be prostitutes, and now they are businesswomen who were taught by Watoto that you are not a hooker, you are not useless, you are not, no, God has made you, you are a daughter of Jesus Christ, saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. And, the, and all of a sudden, these girls who had nothing except kids coming out of them are now running businesses in Kampala. Gary and Marilyn Skinner in God's will said, how do we feed thousands of orphans every year? And all of a sudden God says, go start a chicken farm. I don't know anything about chickens, Lord. And all of a sudden some Canadians come over and set up a chicken farm for them. And then they set up a vegetable farm for them. And so all the kids, thousands of kids who are orphans eat really good food every day and they don't buy anything because they get everything from their farms. They have a hospital with Toto for with Toto people. <laughs> Can you imagine? We should get a hospital just for Church on the Queensway people. We really should. Then we want to have these terrible weights. 
And, and here, here's the craziest thing. They, the kids go to school, Christian school, and they're not taught just to read and write. You are taught to be something. You were made to be something. You're just not going to go get a normal job. You were made to be phenomenal. And the, the most successful students in all of Uganda are coming out of Watoto. So why do I talk about it? Are you ready? Today in the soccer stadium, over 65,000 of them got together and celebrated 40 years of God's will. 65,000 of them today got together and had church. Every Sunday, Watoto has over 45,000 people attending their services. Every week, they have over 30,000 people in small groups all over Kampala in Bible studies. 30,000 people. Every week, hundreds of people are coming to Christ. They can't keep up with the water baptism because there's so many people getting saved. Every week, the discipleship courses are filled. And it all started because this little couple in Listerwell, Ontario, gave up their white picket fence and said, sure, if I get raped or I get murdered or I get robbed or our kids get killed, that's just God's will. Let's do it. Are you nuts? Yeah. But here's the craziest thing. Sometimes you got to be picking nuts to do God's will. I'm a living example of this. My best friends to this day when we get together just laugh. I can't believe you're a pastor. Neither can I. Why would God do that to your congregation? I said they were hard up. They needed somebody crazy. And then one of my friends says, do they come to your church out of sympathy? I said, no, they come because they like to sleep during my sermons. <laughs> Here's the craziest thing. If you're trying to make sense of God's will, a Jew going to Nineveh? Why do we always have to try to make sense before we step out of the boat and walk on the water. If you're faithful in the small things of God's will, he'll bless you in the big things. He'll bless you in the big things. When people start clapping, I know it's, I should end. <laughs> By the way, I would like to just say this to you. Somebody drank my drink. I'll find out later. <laughs> Can I tell you this? Gary and Marilyn Skinner and I, we're friends. And we, we saw each other just a couple weeks ago. They're over there in Uganda right now and they'll be back to visit me. And we're eating chicken wings, which Gary's excellent at doing. Two of the most humblest people going, you would never think God could use them. I mean, they just sit there. If you didn't know the story, you would think, these people are just normal. Well, guess what? That's what God wants. Normal people like you. They don't have a lot of talent, but they were just willing. Jonah, go to Nineveh. No way. Don't hurt God. Hear God. And then help God.